I, it wasn't very long uh, after I met Brother Given that I felt provoked to be engaged in the kingdom. This is one of the one of his ministries is moving people to take the kingdom by force in involving people in the ministry. Uh, every, every member of the body is placed in, in that place by God for, in a specific capacity and in, in a, in a way, not just for you, it's for the rest of the body. And that is part of the reason why Brother Given has these open forums in the, in these renewals is to give opportunity for everyone to, to contribute. This reminds me of Ephesians uh, chapter 4, where we have this insight from the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse 15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So speaking the truth to one another is a catalyst for growth. And so I don't, I don't think it's too far of a stretch to conclude that if someone keeps their mouth closed, then they've cut themselves off from the supply to, of growth. Speaking the truth to one another, the body grows together. Amen. And verse 16 says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, every member supplies. From the head, every member plays a critical part in nourishment being ministered throughout the body. And so I just wanted to give thanks and to highlight that uh, for uh, Brother Given's leadership in, uh, in, our, in this ministry and among us in providing opportunity and, in a way, pressuring people. If God's given you something, it's not just for you. It's, it's, it's for everyone. And so I've, I'm grateful for that provocation uh, to, uh, to speak the things which we have seen and heard. So that's what we want to do uh, today. I want to provide a little bit of direction in uh, tying some of the things together that we have heard, uh, preached, and testified to us. And at any time, um, uh, just make, your, uh, make yourself known and make your way up here, please, for any comments uh, or, or even questions that you have uh, for the sake of everyone hearing and for the recording as well. The, there, there are some stipulations, though, not my own, but uh, from the Holy Spirit in the assembly, uh, whatever is said is, uh, is subject to being put to the test. It says, let, let all prophesy, and says, let the others judge. And so just know that when we're all gathered together with the Spirit, that what you say is subject to judgment. And it's for, it's for, our, for all of our good. In other words, we're not just going to let anything and everything be said. What, everything that's said up here is subject to judgment. Uh, the, the Apostle John said, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. And so everything said here is, is it must be for edification. This is not a, it's not a stage for uh, just, just uh, ranting or telling or hearing something new. So here's some of the direction that I want to go uh, in, in this uh, discussion or this open forum. Firstly, that what Jesus has come to do is what only Jesus could do. Everything that he came to do was uncommon. What he came to do in the world, only he could do. No one had gone before him and done them. Remember when Nicodemus came, he says, We know, Master, that you are from God, because no one could do these things except God sent him. There was something uncommon about Jesus. Nicodemus said, there was another man that came that is, he was exactly like you. No one said this about, about Jesus. He, was, he, was, he is unique. He shares his ministry with, with no one else. He's not a part of someone else's ministry. We're a part of his. But his ministry is unique to him. What Jesus came to do in our behalf, only Jesus could do. Nothing, there's nothing ordinary about Jesus' ministry. Um, you didn't, no one came to hear Jesus and said, oh, he teaches just like Rabbi so-and-so. Oh, or did you hear what he said? That was just what lawyer so-and-so said last week in the, in the synagogue. He is, there's nothing ordinary about him. He is the only begotten of the Son of God. Isn't that right? Amen. 
And so we, it, we shouldn't think it an amazing thing that the work of the only begotten Son of God be only done by him. He did pray, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, and, it, and it, 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 didn't, it didn't pass. It had to be done. What he came to do had to be done. It had to be done by a man. It had to be done by a sinless man. It had to be done in the earth, and it's completely unique. Never, he came and made things known that had never been known before. He revealed secrets that, he revealed mysteries that have been kept secret since the world began. So he's following in no one's footsteps. He's making the footsteps. And we're following in him. He's the forerunner. So he's the first one that has made these things known. What, what, what do you know about God the Father outside of what Jesus has taught you? See, his ministry is, is unique. He's not one of many sources of revelation. He is the revelation of God. No one knows the Father except the Son. And so everything that is known of God came from Jesus, from his teaching, his revelation, his, his ministry. So everything that Jesus has come to do, only Jesus could do. In this way, Jesus... Uh, reserves the glory of redemption to himself. The glory can't go anywhere else because he's doing what only he could do. So is there any, anyone at any time? I, wanna, I, I don't mean I don't want to uh, to dominate things here. This is an open forum. So any anytime anyone has anything, uh, please let yourself be made known. <clears throat> there were things even uh, people who did not see the extent of what Jesus came to do and the extent of who Jesus was, they saw that there was something unordinary about him. Even though they couldn't identify it they, and even though they couldn't receive it, there were people who, who was, they were going to come and make him king by force because they knew that there, there, there isn't another man like this man. And I believe it was prob they probably had some economic motives in, in their intentions to make him king because he had, he had healed people, he had multiplied bread. They said, this, this would be a great benefit to our, to our economy if we could make this man king. They were going to make him king by force. Brother Doug, do you have something? Uh, we got a glimpse of this the, this morning when uh, the testimony of Sister Brandy and Brother Paul, or Pat, when uh, they were surfing the internet, now you think about all of the different kinds of ministries, so-called ministries are on the internet, and they saw Brother Givens. Now, like Christ, there was something about Christ that drew people to him, although they really couldn't put their finger on it. I mean, he did things nobody else did, but he also got killed for such things. The truth, Christ is the embodiment of truth and this is what is being talked about here that's what brother given has put on the internet and people who are interested in the truth are drawn to it just like we're drawn to christ and uh, i don't know what to say it then then that's just the way it is people who want the truth can see it when they see it and people who do not want it you can't draw a picture to them so that they can see it. And uh, it is a great pleasure to be around people who want the truth and feed us truth more and more and more. Now, I've noticed over the years, and this trend I, I still see it very prevalent in the Christian community, that if you raise up a subject about something that people ought to do or a circumstance is rather unfavorable or some point of general disagreement, people don't hesitate to speak up. <laughs> but people are, are very slow 
to respond to things that only have to do with Christ. It's, uh, in a way, it kind of confounds me, but it, it's, it's very, very prevalent. You'll notice, I hope it's not that way here among us. But if you want to spend time with God, at some point the conversation can't be about you. Now sometimes it is, I understand, but it's always the shortest part of the conversation. The thing that God wants us to see is Christ. In fact, the gospel is referred to by John, 1 John 5.10, the record God has given of his son. Not, not, not the record he has given of our sin or the record he has given of our shortcomings or the record he has given of the imminent dangers that we all face or the record of the potency of the devil and the danger of wandering in his territory. Now he touches all of these things, you understand, but this is not the theme of divine conversation. And what Brother Aaron has asked us to do is to consider this marvelous truth of things Jesus has done that no one else has done or can do and without which we can't do and we've got to have them and God has to have them. God, Jesus is necessary to God. He's your savior, he's God's lamb. He's your Lord, he's God's Christ. He's your king, he's God's son. Now which of those really is most important? What he is to God or what he is to you? Jesus has, as we have sought to develop in this renewal, when we talk about Jesus, we talk about accomplishments. We talk about men, we talk about duties. <laughs> Not when you talk about Christ. Amen. So dig down deep into your thinking apparatus you may be tired like I am. Shake yourself. Rise from the dead. And tell us what you think about this. That Jesus has done things that had to be done. You couldn't do them, but they were done for you. And exactly how does this affect your, your thinking? Now, I've got a lot to say about this, so if nobody else did, I could occupy the whole time. But I'm going to actually, I'm going to defer. Why? Because you've got some perspective about this truth that the rest of us need to hear. You've been created in the image of God, and you've been recreated in a more explicit image, in the image of Christ. And I know that most all of you here have some insight that frankly we'd like to hear and so let me urge you to to join in this discussion some of the things that were recently said made me think of some quotations that the apostle peter made in his first letter of what we call the second chapter from isaiah 28 and from isaiah 8 and it goes right to what brother aaron mentioned about jesus revealing himself and people not understanding people not seeing, and many conversations that I've heard among you all, uh, especially as we ate together, and talking about difficulties uh, and disappointments that you've had uh, in finding those who love the truth, the pure yeah. word of God, just the word of God. Yeah. Well, here's some answer to that, and this is, uh, the Apostle Peter quotes a couple of, of phrases of this here from Isaiah chapter 8, warning from, from the Lord, 
here, do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now we know that this was the reaction of the people to the rabbi from Nazareth. Many of them called him a prophet. They, they were willing to give him that much. The prophet from Nazareth. The prophet from Galilee. Who is this? What's well, the prophet from Galilee? But beyond that, uh, there were not many who were willing to confess more than that about him. Now, that's what we've confessed. That's what we're confessing, uh, both in our personal uh, union with him, but also in our preaching during this meeting. We are confessing that he is the one the unique one, one and only begotten of God, who has done these things, who has done these things. And we've, we've drawn from these statements. And of course, there are many more. There are many more than what we have chosen. Uh, many, of them, many of us cite them in our preaching. They're, they're, in, they're written in our hearts, and they just come pouring out as, as we develop our thoughts and things uh, about this. But he is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for those whose priority are uh, people, whether the lost or the saved, if people are their priority, see, well, then Jesus is actually going to be an offense. Now, don't go overboard talking about him now. We know all that. We know all that. We need to get to the important thing. But what does that mean to us? See? You hear statements like that. What's that mean to us? <laughs> when we all know what it means to God is the primary thing. The, uh, the statements that, that Brother Given just cited about who Jesus is to us and to God. Well, see, he's going to be that to God whether he's those things to us or not. That's right. That's right. He's still that to God. And the will and the purpose of God will march forward. And it will just roll right over you. Unless you've joined yourself to it. Unless you've aligned yourself to these things. So that he will not be a stumbling, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to you, but he will be the shadow. You will hide yourself in the shadow of that mighty rock, and you will cast yourself upon that stone and find then redemption and salvation. Mm -hmm. I've really appreciated several things that the brethren have said, but there are a few things that Brother Pat and Brother Boyce have said that really stuck out to me. Brother Pat said this morning that dead things are of no value to God. We know that it is, there's a categorical statement in the Bible that says God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So anything that dies in God's presence, he casts it away. Brother Boyce said, today in the day of grace, punishment is more severe for neglecting salvation. Now, this is because we have been shown more than David or Paul was. When God gives much, he expects much. Amen. When you give him a talent, he expects you to use it for him. And there's many other things that you can do to give God the glory. It's, a, it's an offense to God when we bury our talent in a napkin, as it says in Matthew. In Matthew 25, I'd like to read this. It's the parable of the talents. In verses 28, 27 and 28, this is the Lord reprimanding this wick, wicked and slothful servant. Thou wantest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers or the banks, and then at my coming I, w I, I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him with hatched ten talents. So we must trade and multiply, expound the things that God gives us. We have to be good steward of what God gives to us. And if we're not, then it will be taken from us. Amen. So I've been greatly enjoying what has been said thus far today and yesterday and anticipating tomorrow. Uh, regarding the uniqueness of Jesus and his ministry, 
Um, well, Jesus is not, it's been made, made a point to say that Jesus is, he is separate from sinners. Yeah. A few times now. <clears throat> um, and his, his ministry, his primary ministry, though, has to deal with sin. <laughs> but he is separate from sinners, right? It's just, it's quite the, uh, yeah. it's quite the paradox and the, the unique situation that, that Christ has, uh, has undergirded this work. And this is kind of, his work's even seen, this uniqueness of his work is even seen in, like, the miracles that he's doing. And he'll, he'll like, take a woman with an issue of blood and, She'll be able to, you know, touch him, which would normally defile someone, and or or the the what was it, the hem of a, or the, the garment on the casket, or, and and he wouldn't become defiled, but, and he was able to take the sin of the whole world on him and not suffer any corruption nor undergo decay. <clears throat> so, the uniqueness of Jesus's work, uh, specifically fits God's high requirements. And he does it perfectly. It's, Amen. So praise the Lord. Thank you, brother. I want to call to your attention Colossians 124 and uh, confess to all of you that I have never felt comfortable with my understanding of this verse. And uh, I defer to Brother Given. I know that you've written a lot about Colossians. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, Seth Wilson said something to me 20 years ago about this. I have, I have, like a little child, gone to men whom I respected and said, explain this to me. And uh, so per, I, for me, and maybe it would be helpful to others, Paul said, now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Yeah. Brother Given, teach me. <laughs> or somebody. Paul said that he, he, his agenda of life was to know Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings. In fact, if I might be made conformable to his death. So the truth of the matter is that the obtaining of glory is necessarily preceded by suffering in the, in the world. The tenure of Christ in the world is referred to as the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now the sufferings we participate in are not redemptive in nature. That is, he suffered for our sins. Right? That's not the sufferings we're. That's not the sufferings we're talking about here. They won't. They your sufferings have no saving value. They can't contribute to your salvation. Jesus, in the world. He suffered, he, and he left behind some sufferings that we could participate in and endure because there's some grace and some divine benefits that you can only get when you suffer. Amen. It's the only time you can get them. Now, he didn't leave like a bushel load of these behind so that you just suffered all the time. But he left a remnant of the kind of sufferings he endured at the hand of sinners. And when he was criticized, you know, this hurt Jesus, don't. Jesus loved the Father preeminent, but when people turned their back on him and misrepresented him, and, this didn't make Jesus feel good. It was a form of suffering. And that's the kind of sufferings he's left behind for you to participate in. 
because they're the kind of sufferings for Jesus, they were the kind of sufferings that confirmed he was not of the world. For you, these kind of sufferings help to sever your association with the world. And they're left behind by design because God wants you to know benefits you only learn of when you're in the furnace, when you're in the lion's den, and when you're in a storm for 14 days and when a snake bites you when you're trying to help somebody. There's teachings, there's a classroom that goes on in that suffering that you can't get anywhere else. To my understanding, that's why he left them behind. Jesus suffered for your sins, but he didn't suffer for you in these areas where you have the cross and you're keeping the faith, but he'll go with you through them. I'd like to say that that it, it is a precious thing to suffer with Jesus. And I, uh, I used to think of uh, life as being a, a series of mountains and valleys, and, and that was about the extent of it. Uh, you, go, you go down, and then you come up, and you go down, and you come up. But, but see, I don't, uh, I've, I've got a new perspective now that, uh, see, we rejoice in our tribulations. And see, it's, uh, it, actually, this is a safe you know, Paul says, for you it is safe. Now, I took it out of context, didn't I? But, but, he said, but see, we, this is actually a safe place to rejoice. Actually, there's no boasting when you rejoice in your, in your tribulation, see? But it, I'll tell you, there can be joy in tribulation. You can, you can joy in God, and you can joy in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can, you can know things about him that, uh, that you never uh, knew before. And I, I'll just testify to you that... That in my lifetime, that uh, that the the greatest advances that I have made have been in association with tribulation, and uh, I mean even great tribulation. And uh, I just I just and I thank the Lord that it's this way. You know, it's just kind of like a process. You know, He said it's like a an assembly line process. It's like tribulation works patience, patience works experience, experience works hope, and hope makes not ashamed. Uh, be, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. So it's just like, and it always works that right. Your, your, your spirit will, you, you can attest that it's, this is, you know, you get the tribulation. Now there's going to come the, the experience. And then after that comes the hope. And then it comes, see, it, it always works that way, see. Amen. Something Brother Dan ministered uh, this morning that, uh, that about the, uh, this matter in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, I wanted to, this matter that he, he took upon him the seed of Abraham. Now, I had always thought about this as being like uh, that, that, that when he said that, that he was just selecting a certain part of our, our race. And perhaps that's part of it. You know, perhaps that's involved in it. But, but see, the, uh, the, the thing that, uh, that, that I saw afresh here was that, that this work of salvation is something that you can only perceive by faith anyhow. See, you, you can't see if see the, the, you can't understand or comprehend any of any of these things that have happened at the cross except by faith. See, uh, you have you have to be among this seed in order to comprehend it. See, you have to be among this seed. Now, anybody can be among this seed that really wants to be. See, if you if you want to be, see if you if you want to be, see now there, see whosoever will let him come and take of the water of life freely. Isn't that what the scripture says? And so anyone anyone can can be of this seed that really wants to be, and and anybody that wants to be, the Father, that's evidence that the Father is already working in them and drawing in them, but drawing them, see, so and and he's bringing them to Jesus. But uh, but anyhow, uh, but that was uh, that was a that was a new perspective, and I. I thank Brother Dan for that this morning, and uh, that it, this matter of uh, the 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 uh, this access to God is something that you can only see by faith and only appreciate by faith. I was also considering the uniqueness of Christ, His ministry, 
and why the Lord chose him. Well, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So we, we see that, first of all, God was in Christ. He's working in Christ to bring all of these things to pass. And who better to work through than the one who has the same mind as you, the same desires and motives, the same purpose as your purpose. That's how the father and the son's relationship is. They are one. In, in the scriptures, there are many times when this is referred to in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And many times Jesus spoke about he and his father being one. And in Philippians, it refers to Christ not considering that equality with God, something to be grasped. He was equal with God. And uh, again, the fullness of God dwells in Christ bodily. So God has greater expression and greater, um, greater ministry that it's going to be the most effective when he is working through the one he is one with and Amen. his son, Christ Jesus. Amen. As these uh, sufferings of Christ are concerned, I was th as I was thinking, uh, <clears throat> this is also part of uh, being conformed into the image of Christ is that uh, uh, as you are more further conformed to the image of Christ, the, the, the world is going to treat you the same way that they treated Christ. As they, as they see that in you, they're going to treat you that same way. And it's also given to you uh, for another reason as well, it, to, to make you, uh, give you more of a disdain for the world, you know, to make you, make you a little more, more uncomfortable than you already are in this present evil world, to kind of give you more of a longing for heaven, you know? give you more, more of a fellowship with Christ in that. And as we've been talking about what Christ has accomplished on our behalf in these past few days, uh, and it occurred to me, uh, a lot of the topics, uh, a lot of the sermon topics that we've been talking about, he was bruised for our iniquities. He was made to be sin for us. He was made a curse for us. He spoiled principalities and powers. Uh, he destroyed the devil. He consecrated a new and living way. All of these things are things which Christ accomplished in his death. All of these things are things that Christ did at his weakest point. Now, brethren, what can Christ do now that he is alive? Now that Christ is at his, his now that Christ is seated at the right hand of God, now what can he accomplish? Uh, how, how much more, how can the apostle say now, for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, brethren. So that's, that's, I thought that was good, considering that. I'm grateful for these many considerations that we've had concerning our Savior. And one of the things that, um, that I have experienced, not just recently, but for a while, is that we can safely trust Christ. We can safely put our, put our life into his hands and know that he will lead and guide and direct us. And um, as I was thinking, why? Why can we, why can we safely trust him? Well, it's because God the Father has entrusted him with all things. And so if the Father has placed all things into the hands of his Son, why wouldn't we be able to, to trust him in the things that we have? And Paul wrote about this. He said, um, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we know that God the Father does not place or invest anything in somebody that is not going to return to him a prophet. He, he's, he's about getting, he invests, and he's about getting a return, if you will. And so he has invested everything into his son. All of the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So if you are in him, you're complete. You're complete in him, and we can safely trust in him. So I'm thankful, yes. thankful for that. We've been talking about the suffering and here's a place where we can see the uniqueness of Christ. That we, we, we all suffer and there's sufferings for us, but the sufferings of Christ were unique. It was a play, area where only he could work in these sufferings. And I'd like to read a few verses from Isaiah 63. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? 
this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Which prophet came with dyed garments, with red garments, with blood-stained garments? Only Jesus. And yet he is still traveling in the greatness of his strength. As Brother Matt said, this, in his weakest point, his strength was great, and he still accomplished it. He says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in my anger and will trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold, Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury, it upheld me. So Jesus' uniqueness was his, he did it by himself. He did it alone. And he was, his great strength was even when, when he was alone, and when he was weak, and when he was suffering. And, and no, no other prophet, no other man could accomplish what he did in that way. I'm thankful that um, Brother Gammon has put these renewals together. That way we are able to grow even more. Um, I've been considering what all the brethren have said um, about what Jesus has done on our behalf. And I just wanted to point out one thing that stuck out to me that Brother Gene said. Um, He said that we couldn't pay the price. It was too great of a price for us. There are two scriptures that come to my mind when I hear this. The first one is in 1 John 1, 5. It says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is, is no darkness at all. Um, the other one is um, Romans 3, 10 through 12. As it, as it is written, there is no righteousness, no, not one. There is not one that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They, all, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is, no that no, there is no, none that doth good, no, not one. The reason that I point these out, because I want to tell you all that um, there was no man before the Lord Jesus came that was righteous, that was good, and that was not born to sin. We were all dead. And we needed someone that was completely, had no sin at all, who was clean, and that was not bond to sin, and that was righteous and holy. And the only one who could do this, this was Jesus. So that's one of the million things that Jesus has done for us. And um, someday we'll be able to behold this sinless, righteous man. And I'm still anticipating more from the brethren. I wanted to uh, thank all the brethren that's preached so far because I've really got a lot out of what's been preached. And I just wanted to bring out some points that different brethren brought out. It may be something you said or it may be a thought that I wrote down because of something you said. So um, when Brother Gene was preaching, uh, one of the thoughts I had was that he talked about was this bruising would have killed anyone else. He was the only one that was able to be bruised in this manner. So we're very thankful that our Lord did this because if it would not have been for him, there would be no way that we could be saved. And Brother Silas had a very good message um, speaking about the law of sin and death. He said the law of sin and death is not satisfied with one man or one sin. So, And that was all it took was one sin. And this got me thinking about the flesh and the circumcision of the flesh. Um, how the Israelites under the law had to be circumcised and that was just a small circumcision but when we're born again we have a large circumcision that has to be has to take place so uh, a child when it was circumcised there was only a little bit of time there left until the child had to be circumcised under the law so uh, when we're born again there's just a, a small amount of time when we need to start cutting away the flesh so that, that we can walk in the Spirit. So Brother Silas brought this up in my remembrance so that I could think on these things. And Brother Bob, um, he said, we must, submit to, we must submit to being righteous. Isn't this fitting? Christ submitted to being made sin, so why shouldn't we submit to being made righteous? 
I thought, you know what, that's, that's right. That's very good. Um, there was a lot of good points brought out. I'm just trying to mention one or two of each person. Brother Mike, he brought out, imagine how repulsive it is for God to have uh, had this plan of salvation and put it into place and someone to neglect this great salvation and try to do it their own way. I thought it was a very good point. And Brother Jonathan and Brother Matt uh, spoke about, um, let me see what I wrote here, how God, well, I think Brother Matt said this, God had invested his own image in man and the, and the image had been marred because of sin. So something had to be done about it. God could not let his perfect image be marred and nothing be done about this. Um, and then Brother Tim had a lot of good things too. Um, but one thing he brought out too was that the gospel brings us into connection with the power of God. And several people have brought out how the gospel really does, uh, is the power of God that, that can uh, teach us and cause us to turn towards God. So the, the gospel is very powerful. Brother Pat um, really brought out about the living way, and we talked about this at lunch, how it's never old. It's always new. I mean, I know we go to meetings every week, and we talk about the same things, but they're never old. So it's always good. We always look forward to hearing it. We always look forward to, to learning more and growing in this. So, so the truth is never old. This way is always new, a new and living way. Um, Brother Dan... Oh, and Brother Pat also said that those that are alive are responsive, not just spectators. They're participants. So that's very good. Brother Dan uh, had a very good sermon, too, and he brought out that Jesus' Jesus's death was a militant maneuver, that God is a God, a God of war. And, and I really liked how he brought out about the head of the serpent uh, being the point of contact. And I thought about how, you know, when Jesus done what he did, then we were able to recognize those thoughts that Satan gave us, and, and we were made able to say no, no. We can tell the devil no now because of what Jesus has done. Before, we may not have been able to recognize these things or, or be able to understand that it was a lie. So uh, we're, we were not innocent in our thinking anymore. Uh, the Lord has opened up our, our minds to this. And then, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody, but then Brother Mike... Uh, had a very good sermon too and he talked about the access to grace and one thing I really got out of that is how, how I've been thinking a lot about grace and how big it is and um, he said we have to be prepared to receive the fullness of this blessing yeah. um, so we've got to have a lot of grace to receive the fullness of the blessing of God if you just ponder on this thought how, how big grace is and how much that uh, how much the fullness of God is so no wonder we have to be have to go through a training period here just to be able to get there. And, and I'm sure there's going to be a long time of learning there too, but, but we've got to be trained in this. So this grace is very necessary for, for us to be able to even enter into the kingdom of heaven. But uh, I thank all the brethren for all their comments and their um, uh, sermons. I really appreciate your efforts. Thank God for so great a salvation, for sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And without him, we can do nothing. <clears throat> That's what he said, and it's the truth. Um, in Romans 15, it says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. That every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproaches thee fell on me. <clears throat> for whosoever, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. The blessed hope. The, thank, hope, faith, and charity, these three. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, John chapter 6, there's an there's a instance where Jesus is speaking the word of life. He says uh, in chapter 6 of uh, John, 
He says, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, <clears throat> and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Amen. These things saith he in the synagogue, as he taught in Capernaum, Many, therefore, of the disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can bear it? And it said, Jesus, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured, as it added, he said unto them, Doeth this offend you? Does anything Jesus say, does, does it offend you? No, I don't. It doesn't offend us at all. We want to hear what he has to say. <clears throat> A little further on, he says, uh, it says, Therefore I say unto you that no man can come unto me except ever given to him of my father. From that time, from that time, from that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were offended of this saying. And he said, no, 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 don't come back. I'll explain more what I'm talking about. No, he didn't say. He didn't say no more. That was it. They went. He let them go. And then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? I love the response of Peter, that blessed apostle. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. And he does. No other place we can go but to Jesus. God Drew him, drew, drew us to Christ, and Christ drew us to God. Amen. Amen. It, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. He gives us faith to believe. He gives us ears to hear, and He saves us from our sins. We are, we are able to confess, repent. And be baptized because Jesus came and saved us. Yes. And there's another instance here. <clears throat> it's talking about Jesus' death. It was on the cross. Before this, he says, Therefore my Father has loved me, because I laid down my life, <laughs> that I might take it again. No man take it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. I'm going to give account of all the Gospels, what Jesus said before he died. In Matthew, it says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, you were up the ghost. He died. And Mark, it says that when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he gave up the ghost. He died. Jesus died. And Luke, when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into my, to thy hands have I commend my spirit. Having thus said, he gave the ghost. John, it says, when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished and bowed his head, gave up the ghost. Jesus died for our sins. So the theme of this renew is, what has Jesus accomplished in our behalf? Well, everything.
two things I wanted to mention, and Brother Bill brought up one of them, and I'll say it again. Brother Tim reminded us that we cannot believe in Jesus unless the Father gives us to Jesus. And he just read that from John 6. And there, in 1 Corinthians 15, which verse do we have here? 24, then cometh the end when he, Christ, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. And so God the Father gives people over to Jesus. And in this age of grace, we learn of him. We heard this morning about following him as our way and our savior. And he trains us in this way. And then at the end, Christ is giving us back to God the Father. As though we're under the care of Christ here for a time. Now, I don't understand all the implications of that. And as we think about it, maybe the Lord will show us some more. But that was one thing I wanted to mention. And then Brother Mike was talking about our access to God being in Christ. Jacob was given a vision of that as he is fleeing from his brother. He has this dream in which he sees a ladder set up from earth to heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the ladder. When Nathaniel makes his confession, after hearing what Jesus says about him, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. He says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus said, have you believed because you have heard these things? You're going to see greater things than these. Truly I say to you, have, hereafter you shall see the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Amen. So that is a picture of our access to God. Amen. Now, Amen. I'm still a little stumped, and you can think on this one too why it's angels, they're messengers of God, they're the ones who go up and down. Now, when we go up to God, that's one time, we don't come back down to the earth again. But the angels of God, the holy angels, they're on his errands, they do his work, and probably Christ is their access, travel way too, he is also ours. But why it's pictured as angels instead of a picture of men, but it was shown to Jacob for a purpose. Yeah. It's Christ, but God will probably lighten that up for us some more too. This way. The holy angels are ministering spirits. As we make our way into the holy place by faith, how about the angels escorting us up there? Huh? And bringing us back. <laughs> well, I think about the uniqueness of Christ's speech. The never man spake as this man spake. This was what the contention was about. It wasn't about his healing. It was about what he said. It's just why they killed him. So in John 5... The hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. This was a powerful voice, words that had power associated with them. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. How did he get this? Back in verse 19... The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. Amen. So it's seeing and speaking. Because what Jesus saw of the Father, that he spoke. And that had the power of life in it. And so he didn't speak as the scribes and the Pharisees. He, he spoke with authority. So then when the apostles are brought before the rulers, <laughs> they said, 
they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They said, we cannot but speak of the things we've seen and heard. So they saw something and they spoke it out. And then they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. As we continue to labor in this world to live for the Lord and to do all things righteous and holy in his sight, Christ, he is very meek. For, for those who love him and care for him and desire to uh, labor, we can come to him. And it's a, he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is not the way he spoke to everyone. For those who were his enemies, it was not a pretty sight. But for those who love him and care for him and desire to be with him and be pleasing to the Father, he, is, he will give you what you need when it comes to tenderness. He will not break a bruised reed. He will, he will, he will take you and gently help you along. This is what was, what was and what is and what has been very special to me as I know who I was before Christ. I know what, what worth I had in my own eyes, which was nothing before Christ. But when Christ came, his tenderness is what I needed. He is tender to those who, who need tenderness, and we need tenderness. So I'm thankful for that, to see that in Christ. Yeah. First, I want to tell you that I am thankful and grateful to be here. I couldn't be here last year, but this year I made it. Lord, he brought me here, Amen. and I'm thankful. And I've appreciated every message so far, and I know I'll appreciate all the rest. Um, when I first heard... I was listening to the news, and they said that there was a uh, tornado that hit Joplin, and I thought, oh, my goodness. So I called Sister Barbara, and she said that everybody was fine, so that eased my mind. <laughs> I was thankful for that. But um, I don't know about you, but whenever you go to the, I don't know what you call it, church, but anyway, the first thing they'll say, oh, the weather's beautiful. It's the day that the Lord hath made. Oh, it's beautiful. Or they'll say, oh, it's lousy. And uh, anyway, I, I looked that scripture up in Psalms. It's the 118th uh, Psalm. And uh, I'll start at verse 18 and read it. It says, the Lord hath ch chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over to death. I I'm not sure, but I think that's talking about Christ, isn't it, there? But anyway, um, it says, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go in into them, and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous enter. Praise God. We can enter in. I will, I will praise thee, uh, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused became the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord hath made. That's the one I like to think of, the day. Of the <laughs> so whenever they, t they say, this is the day that the Lord has made, I think, oh, when are you going to wake up? Mercy. But anyway, <laughs> um, well, I forgot where I was at. It says, we will rejoice and be glad in it. And I am glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. I beseech thee, 
Sin now prosperity. And here's another one I like. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We, uh, we have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And um, I think that's what he told the Jews. That um, when they say that, then they'll... Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I'm looking for that day, too. <laughs> but uh, let's we'll see. There was one more thing I was going to say. Can't remember. That's what I'm looking forward to, a new body. When my brain can hold things. Right now, it just I can listen to something, and it'll just, I'll hear it. Of course, then sometime later, maybe it'll, maybe it will come back in. And sometimes it doesn't. But I am thankful for the Lord. And um, Brother, I was talking to Brother L about, uh, and I can't remember the scripture, where it says, remember the rock from whom you were hewn and the pit from which you were dug. Dig. And I was trying to figure out what he meant by the, uh, you know, I was thinking, asking, well, what do you mean by the rock you were hewn? And... Uh, and he, he explained some things to me, and it helped me to see that we're in the pit, and we're being uh, hammered on and chiseled away and made, it, made uh, perfect in the Lord's eyes. Amen. And so Amen. I, that's what I had today. <laughs> Even if it was shaky getting up here, I made it. I, too, with uh, Sister Bev, want to give thanks to the Lord because when we heard about the uh, devastation here our hearts were immediately drawn to all of our brethren um, and we were thankful that he put his hand over the brethren as he passed over Joplin uh, I want to say a, a birthright was given to the firstborn and would we, they would receive a double portion of the father's wealth and property when we were born we had no birthright. Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. He is, his is a royal birthright, a heavenly birthright. What Christ's atoning death has accomplished for us, we now have a birthright, the, and the Father recognizes us in his Son. Yes. Um, I really appreciated what Brother Pat said about the things of God being new and that they never grow old, and it reminded me of the Israelites' clothes that never grew old when they wandered in the wilderness, and that the manna never grew old when it came time for the Sabbath. And it also reminded me of 2 Corinthians 4.16. It says, But though our outward man perisheth, yet the inward man is renewed day by day, and also God's mercies are new every morning. I'm believing today because of what Christ has done for me. Yeah. And I'm sustained today because what Christ is doing for me. And because we believe, I mean, that's our work. But we couldn't do that unless Christ was in us. And I'm, I'm going to share something that I remembered hearing Brother Gibbons say in one of the MP3s that I've listened to. He talked about being fully persuaded. And he brought up, he mentioned uh, the Twin Towers. You all remember the Twin Towers in New York. And he, he said that to uh, imagine a high wire stretched from one building to another, and then a man pushing a wheelbarrow across that high wire. If you see him, you can believe that he can do it. But being fully persuaded is when you get in that wheelbarrow. And when you're fully persuaded and you get in that wheelbarrow, you know, and Christ is the one that's in control of your life, what a deliverance and what a joy that is. And you can go through anything. You can be in a dry, thirsty land where you don't have meetings like this, and he can sustain you. You can be around people that are half-hearted day in and day out, 
but you can still be fully persuaded and you can still stand year after year, renewal after renewal, because of what Christ is doing. I am fully persuaded. Um, I am fully, con I am content in any situation. Thus far I can say that only because of the grace of God. And sometimes you might have to only be fed through MP3s, but God, with Christ's work through Christ, can sustain you that way as well. And I stand here as living proof of that. This is where, this is where the richness is in person. And I just, when I first arrived, I wept so much because to me it's like a picture of going home. And then we go separate when our time, we know right now we have time that separates us and distance. But with Christ doing his continual work, one day we'll all go home and we will never part again and we won't have to fight anymore this flesh and we'll never go out again and I so look forward to that day. One major thing that Christ is doing and has been doing is saving those who believe. By dying on the cross, he is now able to save us. Brother Pat had said that the law can't do what Christ has done. The law can't save you, but Christ can. If you follow the law it only, it's not going to save you, but if you follow Christ, you will be saved. Christ gives eternal life, and the law can't. That's just one thing that makes Christ unique. He's the only one who can save. Brother Tim said that we, we die to the law so that we can live for Christ. Romans 6, verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Everything, Brother Pat said that everything in Christ stays new, and if what you have feels dull, then you have got the wrong thing. Christ never becomes dull. In the world, there may be someone who is telling you a story, and they tell you so many times, and it gets dull or annoying. But when you are in fellowship with Christ, and you keep hearing one particular, particular thing over and over, it doesn't get dull. But Christ's, but Christ's word will never get dull. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I like this thought, too, of Christ and how he is unique. And one thing that um, I have seen real clearly this year of what Christ has accomplished is he has made it possible for us to become like God, like him. And anything, you know, that is not of God it has to be cast from him. It is unrighteous, unholy, and obviously it cannot mingle with righteousness and holiness. So then how can we be with God? How can we be like him? Because to be with him, we have to be like him. God was made to have fellowship with man. That's why he made man. And sin took that away. So how then can this be? Well, we have to be transformed, changed, born again, renewed. There is life before birth. I'm wholly convinced of this. You can see in pictures, in technology nowadays, you can see pictures of a baby growing, changing. And even after birth, through birth and after birth, there's life. Through the whole existence of that person on the earth, he is continually changing. Our physical bodies continually change, and this is also true with our spiritual. We're always changing. And change, change it, it hurts. Growing pains, adapting to something new, it, it hurts you. And so imagine yourself being totally changed from what you were before to the exact opposite. So there's no surprise to us that we are hurting in this world, that there's pain. But this pain is promised to us to be bearable. Jesus, he suffered the ultimate, so what we go through for him, we can do it, and we do it in him. And this is also why we are able to rejoice in suffering. Knowing even a glimpse, I say a glimpse because we don't know the whole picture yet, but even knowing a little bit, seeing what God is accomplishing in you, it makes this hurt worthwhile. There is a purpose, there is a reason, there is a time for everything. And in this, in trials, and in, we receive correction, and we see what needs to be put off, what needs to be put on, 
We learn through change. We learn through pain. So in being this not alone, you know, God is with us through this change and through this pain. You know, even though we may not want to admit it, we want comfort in pain. Some people, I know me too, when I'm in pain, I don't really like to admit it. I like, you know, kind of just want to hide. But even then, I still want comfort. Everyone wants comfort. It's not comfortable to be in pain. But in this, what we go through for Christ, we're learned to depend upon God. Because he is the one who gives us this comfort. So that is what is partly of what is involved in this change. It hurts, but it is worth it. And there is no reason why that we should not live our, Christ, our lives for Christ. The truth shall make you free. That's what the scripture says. Another version says the truth shall set you free. But I like this word make because it's a broader term. When you hear make, you think of effort put into it. And you think of an effect and an outcome. While as set, it's just you just set it free. So in being made free, being made like God, it sounds good. So he is making us like him. He is unique. He is making us unique. So let us not lose the things which we have wrought, lest we lose our reward. I had a couple of things I wanted to bring out that really stood out to me. One was uh, Brother Tim McCulfer's message. He talked about um, that when you see how futile it is to establish your own righteousness, you will be ready then to accept his. And um, I just, I haven't seen it this clearly before, just exactly um, how this can be hidden from you, you know, and you not recognize it. Uh, the righteous things that we do, he mentioned, you know, are just like the obvious fruit. Then you think if you're doing those things, then it's obviously I'm, you know, I'm oh, okay. Or my righteousness is uh, there, the, you know, the fruit of it. But it's not always necessarily true because your heart may not be right, you know, it's not coming from the right source. And so um, he just brought that really clearly out there that it's not our efforts, it's, it's God's righteousness. And I've uh, just never had it you know, be that clear to me that we need Jesus to make uh, our righteousness for us, not our, not our works. And then he also had it simple and clear in the two choices that he said, we either submit to God's righteousness or we try to do our own. It was, it was these two different um, ways we could look at it. We can either be in the ark or we can be in the water. And uh, we can, it's, it's heaven or hell. I mean, it's just like that clear, but sometimes it's not that clear. It's like in God's light, we see light. So, you know, this, that's what these preaching sessions do is, is to bring that to light. And that really helps to help us see it a lot clearer. Uh, the other thing with Brother Boyce's message and talking about total subject, totally subjecting ourselves to God's will. And uh, it's in the little things that you may not always recognize. He brought out that scripture from Psalm 36 about uh, sometimes we flatter ourselves too much where we don't even recognize the sin in our life. And so we can't see that we're not in subjection to God, that we're doing our own things for our own selfish reason. And um, also that um, the example of the Israelites who were killed for just murmuring, we might think of that being a minor thing. You know, it's not up there with the big, the big sins or the total rebellion, but it's any kind of complaining or uh, not accepting anything in, in any way that God has said to do is rebellion to God, and he killed people for that then, you know, so we have to take this more seriously, and uh, the, the ultimate example was that Jesus did his Father's will, and I hadn't thought about that as long as he brought that out, that you think about where he came from, his position, you know, he was there with God in glory, you know, there in the creation, all the things that he was doing together with his Father, he could have easily said, no, I think it ought to be this way and want, you know, his way and, and part of this plan, you know, of our salvation. But we hear nothing of that. It's always your will be done, you know, in every way that we, we are reading in his words. So he, he's the ultimate example for that. So I thought that was really In about the last hour or so, this scripture came to mind. Let me find it so I don't mess it up. And it started making me think what we're talking about. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. It made me start thinking of what Jesus is doing for us now. 
And it made me think back to the law where you had to go and buy a sheep or an ox. You had to give your grain for an offering. You had to buy or raise or something and bring it to the high priest. In the book of uh, 2 Samuel, David, in 2 Samuel 24, 24, and it says, And the king said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God, that which doth not cost me nothing. Before Christ came, that is what you had to do to be accepted. But when Christ came, what did he do? He had a man. He, 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 he went up to a couple fishermen. They were out there mending their nets. Come, follow me. He didn't say, come, bring your nets. A couple other ones were fishing. No, don't, come, follow me. Don't bring your fish. I'm going to make you fishers of men. Yeah. This one came and asked him, Master, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? And through this length of conversation, what did Jesus tell him? He said, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor. We have nothing to bring to the table. God is the one that has prepared the table for us. Amen. And he's done this through Jesus Christ. Amen. He came to a woman at a well. Yeah. She came to get water. A simple task. But Jesus tells her about this living water. Did he ask her for anything? No. She asked him. Give me of this water. And he told her about this water that you will never thirst after again. It's flowing. It's living water. She brought nothing to him. God, Christ said, if I be lifted up, we'll draw all men to me. That's what I've gotten out of this, this thought. That we bring, now I'm not saying it's not going to cost us nothing. It's going to cost us everything. But we are not purchasing nothing. We are laying it all aside. Christ is the one that paid the price. And all we have to do is it's our reasonable service to present our bodies as living sacrifices. So I've been waiting for quite a while to come up and say that. Never had the opportunity because people, you know. So I just, I just look at this and, you know, it is so easy, and it's been brought up a couple times, it is so easy to get into that law mentality yeah. of having to do, having to do, having to do to be accepted. But never once did Christ say, bring this, buy this for me. He said, come. Come and follow me. So that's just what I wanted to say. Brethren, my name is Ada Hutchcraft. I would uh, like to share with you some thoughts that Brother Mike just stirred up in my mind regarding Psalm 103, verse 12, a text known to many of us. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And uh, I want to uh, elaborate on some of the things that I've been blessed by in ruminating on this text. We know, of course, that, re that sin is rebellion against God. It is moving away from God and God's will. It is choosing something other than what God wills and where God is going. And this east and west, what stirred up my mind on this was that this is uh, this is directional navigation kind of talk, east from west. And I used to think of it only in context, well, the east never meets the west, right? So in that sense, we're separated from our sin. Thinking upon this further, I thought, this really is repentance speak. To repent is to turn, to go in another direction. We were in sin, moving 
in another direction. God was going this way, we were going that way. We were in fellowship with darkness. And God has called us into fellowship with his son. And now we are brought moving in the same direction he is going. So in that sense now, we aren't walking in sin. Our sin is removed from us as far as the east is from the west. It's also a sort of covenant speak. We are putting ourselves in covenant with God that we are going to go wherever he goes, speak what he speaks, and do what he, do, he does. We are going to go in the same direction of God. And what I also love about this is that it, to have our sin removed in this way, as far as the east is from the, the west, so he has removed our transgressions from us our sins will not follow us. Yeah. Amen. So he is faithful when we repent that our sin will not be held against us. I was thinking about something during uh, Brother Pat's sermon uh, when he was talking about uh, the gospel is always renewed. The things of heaven is fresh every time we hear it. And I was thinking about how the older I became, become as a believer, the more stale things of this world become. I, I remember as a child, and, and I know this, this is probably going to be a little humorous, but I, I, I don't mean to be joking. I just, it, I just thought of this. When I was a child, I, I remember listening to some older people, and they would tell me earthly stories. And the first time I heard them, it was interesting. But then, you know, these, these older people, their memory wasn't so good. And every time I was around them, they probably forgot that they had told me that story before. And I had to hear it again and again and again. And it got stale. Now, I remember receiving it with kindness, but it didn't mean nothing to me anymore. Well, the world is like that, but the gospel is not. Every time I hear the gospel expounded, I well up with joy. It's just, it's just, that, it's just that living water that just keeps flowing from the throne of God, and it's fresh, fresh, fresh. It never gets stale, and I'm so thankful for that, that, that Christ has done this through God. Now, one other thing I was considering during Brother, Mike, Brother Mike's sermon, uh, and I'm thankful for his sermon because it, uh, it gave me a different, a, a more clear outlook on, on what Jesus really accomplished on the cross that When Jesus walked among us as a man, he did not participate with sinners. He had no part in, in it at all. Uh, I know people were drawn to him, but uh, as it's been known many times, out of his kindness, he fed them, he healed them, but they were drawn to him for the wrong reason, and he didn't participate in that. And I, it's, it's difficult for me to make this point, but as that's followed through all the way to the cross, there you have a situation where it was demanded of Christ to actually become something which was sin and not participate in it. Yeah. Uh, this, this really become clearer for me yesterday when Brother Mike was preaching. I'm so thankful for that because he had to remove sin away from God, and the only way to do that was to take hold of it. He had to take it with him, yeah. and, and that, that become a lot clearer to me, and uh, who else could have done that? So I'm thankful. Is there anyone who's been trying to press through the crowd and not been able to make it yet? I can, I can help you at this moment if you 
Okay, Brother Doug. <clears throat> what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. It says in more than one place in the scriptures that all things were made by him and for him. We were made by him and for him. We went off into the world and got lost, and he came and found us and took our hand and brought us back to himself. He is the author and finisher of our faith, the beginning and end of all things. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Without Christ, we wouldn't even be here. Nothing, none of this would be here. There would be no purpose to it. And there's a whole lot more now <laughs> that haven't had a chance to share with us today. Okay, it's very good things. I've, I know I've benefited from it and want to thank you for, for sharing. We're going to take a short break.